Well, hello everyone. We're back again at uh, our Bible study looking at Mark, the Gospel according to Mark. Uh, we left off at chapter 14 and we're going to uh, pick up where we left off at verse 10. Um, I might mention this. This is going to be a little different than uh, the ones that I have done uh, thus far on this study. Different in the sense that it is, uh, well, uh, we're going to dig a little deeper. And I'm going to use uh, some notes. I usually don't use a, a, a notes uh, on this study, but I think it would be prudent to uh, use some notes here because uh, we're getting into an area of, of very important doctrines that are, are uh, will be dis uh, one in particular that will be discussed. Uh, so having said that, uh, you bear with me if I have to use some notes here, okay? Uh, let's bow our heads. Father, in the name of Jesus, we praise you, we thank you, we're grateful for the blessed word that teaches us and encourages us and equips us to live in the world that we live. But more than this, it helps us, dear Lord, to draw closer to thee. We want to know your mind and your thoughts uh, concerning uh, the things that you would share with us. So bless us with your Holy Spirit. Guide us and teach us and direct us, for it's in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Uh, all right. Uh, chapter 14 of Mark, uh, verses 10 and 11 uh, this is where Judas agrees to uh, betray Jesus, uh, uh, changing uh, the plans of the Jewish rulers. It says this, Then Judas, Judas is a carrier, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray him to them, and when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. So he sought how he might conveniently uh, betray him. All right. It says here, Judas is a chariot, is one of the twelve, one of the original uh, dis disciples. Now, uh, a lot of people speculate uh, on the motive of Judas. Uh, perhaps his feelings were hurt when Jesus rebuked him after Mary or the ointment over Jesus' feet. Uh, perhaps uh, it was uh, plain old greed, you know. Uh, greed's been around a long time, hasn't it? Still is. Some speculate that Jews, Judas wanted to uh, force Jesus into an open display of messianic glory. I think that's far-fetched, but that's what some people think. Now, in Matthew... Chapter 26, verse 15, it makes clear that Judas bargained with the uh, religious leaders for the life of Jesus. He asked them, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? That's in Matthew. Uh, certainly part of his motivation was plain, old, pure uh, greed. Uh, whatever Judas' motive was, it was his motive. God used the wicked work of a willing Satan. Uh, uh, the, let me back up here. God used the wicked work of a willing Satan who used a willing Judas. God ordained that these things should happen, but he did not prompt Judas uh, to sin. That wasn't from God. That was uh, from uh, Judas, uh, or from the devil. Uh, or it probably could originate, probably originated with uh, Judas himself. We blame a lot of things on the devil, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's so. It says, when they heard it, they were glad. 
uh, they were glad. The religious leaders had wanted to destroy Jesus for a long time. Mark 3, 6. Now they had a, a, an ally, a disciple, was willing to betray Jesus Christ. And now, we go to the final Passover with his disciples. Uh, Mark chapter 14, verses uh, 12 through 16. Preparation for the Passover, the feast remembering Israel's redemption. That's the Passover. I know a lot of Christians try to practice this. That's ridiculous. Uh, that, that, that is not for us to practice. Uh, we are a New Testament people. Okay. Now on the first day, I'll read it here. On the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and prepare that you may eat the Passover? And he sent out two of the disciples and said to them, Go into the city. And a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow, follow him. Wherever he goes in, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, Where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large upper room. Furnished and prepared there, make ready for us. So his disciples went out and came into the city and found it just as he said to them, and they prepared the Passover. Now, it says a man was carrying a picture, a picture, a picture, a picture, <laughs> okay? Okay. Uh, this was, uh, you know, to be very honest, it was a very unusual sight. Women usually carried liquids in uh, pitchers, and men normally carried liquids in animal skin containers. Uh, therefore, a man carrying a pitcher was uh, a distinctive sign to the disciples. He, he'd be clearly, clearly picked out. Now the teacher says, our scripture says, the teacher says, where is the guest room? The scene here implies secrecy. And Jesus had good reason to quietly make arrangements for Passover. Jesus didn't want Judas to betray him before he could give a final important talk to his disciples. Now, the Lord uh, Cole, a fellow named Cole, says this. The Lord must have had many unknown disciples upon whom he could rely at such moments to render unquestioning service, obviously. Now it says they prepared the Passover. This seems to be a difference between the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, uh, about the Passover. The implication in the Synoptic Gospels is that Jesus was crucified on the day after Passover and that this meal was the day before. John seems to say that Jesus was crucified on the day of Passover itself as a Passover over lamb, John 18:28 and 19:14. Possibly the best explanation is that there were different calendars. You know, we need to take everything into account here. There were different calendars in use. Jesus died as the Passover victim. victims were being slain according to the official calendar. But he had held the Passover with his followers the previous evening according to the unofficial calendar thus says a fellow named uh, Morris and that was quite helpful none of the synoptic gospels mention a lamb at the Passover meal some believe that this is because they could not obtain one before the official day of Passover Jesus may have wanted it this way 
in order to emphasize the idea that he was the Passover sacrifice. That's what he was. All right. Now Jesus gives Judas, amazingly, uh, a chance to repent. Verses 17 through 21. Here's what it says. In the evening, he came with the twelve. Now as they sat and ate, Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you who eats with me will betray me. And they began to be sorrowful and to say to him one by one, Is it I? And another says, Is it I? He answered and said to them, It is one of the twelve who dips with me in the dish. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him. But woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had never been born. Ooh. All right, now. Let's back up and look at this a little bit closer. It says he sat down with the twelve. At the first Passover, God commanded them to eat the meal standing. That was the way that it was done and ready to leave Egypt. This is in Exodus 12, 11. Since Israel came into the promised land, they believed that they could eat the Passover setting or reclining because now they were at rest in the land God gave them. Then it says in our text, one of you who eats with me will betray me. The disciples heard many surprising things from Jesus, but certainly this was one of the most surprising things that they had ever heard throughout uh, their following him. Not one of them suspected Judas, and the idea that one of them would seek to betray and kill Jesus must have seemed just ridiculous. All right, the text says it is one of the twelve who dips with me. In saying who dips with me, Jesus did not single out Judas, uh, though Judas sitting in the place of honor would have been given the special portion. All the disciples, every one of them, uh, dipped with him. So this phrase identified the betrayer as a, listen, as a friend as a friend. Uh, in the Middle Eastern culture, betraying a friend after eating a meal with him was, and to this day, is regarded as the worst kind of treachery. And surely it was. Amen. All right. The text says, Woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Judas is rightly regarded as one of the most notorious sinners of all time. How many people do you know that uh, today that's been named Judas? Their, their legal name. You don't know of any. Uh, it, it's, it's terrible. Even though uh, his actions fulfill prophecy, the Son of Man indeed goes just as it was written of him, the text says. His own wicked motive condemned him. Judas will never be able to justify himself before God on the day of judgment by claiming uh, something like, well, I was just fulfilling prophecy. In the warning of Jesus, we see a profound love for Judas. This was his last fleeting opportunity to turn back from his evil plot. A remarkable thing to remember is that Jesus loved both Mary and Judas. We almost want to think that he loved Mary and hated Judas, but that isn't the case. If we miss his love towards Judas, Rejected love, to be sure, if we miss that love, we miss the whole story of the Bible. We ourselves have rejected Christ's love numerous times before uh, we came to him in love and grateful 
for his salvation. All right, now let's look at the Last Supper. This is where we get into some a very uh, uh, important doctrine, the Last Supper. And I'm using notes on this primarily because I have a swayed uh, uh, opinion and understanding, and I don't want to sway you. I, I want it to be as is, as it should be. Uh, the Last Supper, this, verses 22 through 25. And as they were eating, it says, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them, and said, Take, eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Assuredly, I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. All right, let's, let's slow down here and back up and go over this. Let me have a sip, okay? Oh, I'm ready now. Okay. It says, Jesus took bread, blessed, and broke it. Uh, when the bread was lifted up at Passover, the bread of the meal would say, this is the bread of affliction, uh, the head of the meal, not the bread of the meal would say. This is uh, the bread of affliction, which our fathers are in the land of Egypt. Let everyone who hungers... Come and eat. Let everyone who is needy come and eat the Passover meal. Everything eaten at the Passover meal had a, a symbolic meaning. The bitter herbs uh, recall the bitterness of slaver, slavery. Uh, the salt water remembered the tears shed under Egypt's uh, oppression. The main course of the meal, a lamb freshly sacrificed uh, for that particular household did not symbolize anything con connected to the agonies of Egypt. It was the sin-bearing sacrifice that allowed the judgment of God to pass over the household that believed. You know, they could go through the motions, but that was to no good if they didn't believe. Amen? Same things today. All right. Jesus has said, take, eat. This is my body. This is my blood of the new covenant. Jesus didn't give the normal explanation of the meaning of each of the foods, as was expected. He reinterpreted them in himself, and the focus was no longer on the suffering of Israel in Egypt, but on the sin-bearing suffering of Jesus on their behalf. All right. He said, this is my body. Christians had debated for hundreds of years about the true nature of the bread and the cup at this supper. Now, that's where the controversies come in. The Roman Catholic Church holds the idea of transubstantiation, which teaches that the bread and the wine actually become the body and blood of Jesus. Uh, Martin Luther held the idea of consubstantiation, which teaches that Bread remains bread and the wine remains wine, but by faith, they are the same as Jesus' actual body. Luther did not believe in the Roman Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation, but he did uh, not go far from it. Uh, now, Calvin... John Calvin taught that Jesus' presence in the bread and wine was real, but only spiritual, not physical. Zwingli, 
a great theologian, taught that the bread and wine are symbols that represent the body and blood of Jesus. Uh, these last two are most popular with uh, our uh, Protestant churches today. According to Scripture, we can understand that the bread and the cup are not merely symbols, but they are powerful pictures uh, to partake it, to enter into as we see the Lord's table as the new Passover. Take, Jesus said, take, eat. We can't get so caught up in discovering what the bread and cup mean that we forget to do what Jesus said to do with them. We must take and eat. You know, if you're at you're a Christian and you're in, and, and, and the communion is offered, uh, the Lord's Supper, and you you just refuse to take it, you're saying, no, Jesus, eat it yourself. Come on. Take means that it won't be forced upon you. You have to receive it. Eat means that this is absolutely vital for you. Without food and drink, we perish. Amen? Without Jesus, we perish. It also means that you must take Jesus into your innermost being. There's another good meaning. He said, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many beyond all controversy uh, about what the elements of this supper really are and what they really mean. The announcement that Jesus brings a new covenant, that's what's important, stands out. No mere man could ever institute a new covenant. In church it says they have a new covenant, they're, they're in big trouble. Uh, there can be no other uh, covenant between God and man, but Jesus is the God-man. He has the authority to establish a new covenant covenant uh, sealed with blood even as the old covenant was sealed with blood exodus 24 verse 8 uh, the covenant is focused on an inner transformation that's where it focuses uh, that cleanses us from all sin for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. Jeremiah 31, 34. The transformation puts God's word and will in us. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. Jeremiah 31, 33. This covenant is all about a new close relationship with God. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Jeremiah 31, 33. Now the text says, Until that day when I drank it new in the kingdom of God, Jesus has not yet celebrated a Passover in heaven. He still waits for all his people to be gathered to him and then there will be a great Supper, the marriage supper of the Lamb, uh, Revelation 19, 9. This is the fulfillment in the kingdom of God Jesus longed for. <laughs> Excuse me. All right. I hope that covered it. Uh, I, it gives you a lot to think about, doesn't it? I pray that you, uh, you uh, um, consider this, meditate upon it, on the word of God. And, uh, and then make your decision. What does the uh, Lord's Supper mean to me? Mean to me? And then evaluate it according to the Scripture. Pray. Ask the Holy Spirit to teach you and guide you into truth. And then just wait. Wait. Wait upon the Lord, and he will open up your mind and your heart, and you'll, 
you'll understand it better than you under, ever understood it before. That's for sure. Um, let's see. All right, Mark chapter 14, 26 through 31. Uh, this is where Jesus predicts the desertion of the disciples and Peter's denial. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even if all were made to stumble, yet I will not be. Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you that today, even this day before the rooster crow twice, you will deny me three times. But he spoke more vehemently, If I have to die, die with you I will not deny you and they all said likewise well you know actions speak louder than words don't they let's see we're getting close to our time I'm going to have to hold up there this would be a good place to hold won't it because we will come back and we will look at Mark 14 uh, 26 through 31 uh, and we'll look at it closely uh, it's an important part of our text obviously so uh, this would be a good time to ask are, are there any questions <laughs> uh, well if you have any questions just send them to me if you have any comments send them to me also uh, if you have a difficulty with this way of, of teaching where it, it's a little more in-depth and I'm using notes, uh, if you'd rather I do it this way, great. If you'd rather I not, that's all right, too. You, you need to let me know, though. Otherwise, you know, just let me know. I can go either direction. All right. You want to continue with me doing using notes? Say so. If not, say so. Uh, I'm not going to be offended one way or the other because it's the Word of God. Uh, all the comments are secondary. All right. Let's remember uh, uh, our nation. Uh, we're getting ready for a transition not too long, and that we can't pray any time too early, can we? Let's remember everyone. Uh, remember those that are sick and afflicted uh, with COVID or any other disease for that matter. I appreciate uh, Crystal uh, putting those things on the internet so we can pray together for them and rejoice in answered prayer. Amen. Uh, if you're wondering why I'm wearing these clothes, it's cold. And I don't like it. It's cold here. Amen. I, uh, but God will keep us. You know, I can be have cold feet but a warm heart because of Jesus. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Christ, we pray that you would bless us throughout the week, uh, that you would help us to be mindful of your presence everywhere we go, uh, that uh, we would honor you and, and obey you, that we, we would be a blessing on your behalf to the people that we know. Uh, keep us safe. Keep us from harm. Keep us from this virus. And bring us back again. For it's in the name of Jesus Christ we give you thanks and glory. Amen and amen. God bless you all.